Winter Latina Show. Hosted by IDM. Here we are again, alive Hello and kicking. Hello and welcome to the most popular show, which is probably why YouTube didn't like us. Apologies for a slight delay. We had to restart a whole bunch of things technically, but luck as luck would have it, we have a tech genius um, participating in this project. That's his project, in fact. So <laughs> you should stop calling me that. That's bad luck. Oh, That's why things big, are not working. Oh, Marcelo, he's terrible at technology. He just yeah. doesn't know what he's doing. But anyways, no, yes, no. apologies for a slight delay. Uh, it's because we had to basically restart uh, a bunch of things that were happening uh, on the back end with, with YouTube because we're so popular, obviously. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's what I always say. The CIA is taking a look on us. <laughs> Probably multiple, multiple agencies um, yeah. from, from, from various countries. But um, uh, we're going to talk about the, the case of Navalny, which has obviously been in the news since uh, last week. And my question would be to you, Marcelo, you're sort of an outsider looking in. You are you know, living in the environment of Western mainstream media. And your information mostly comes from from that media, and of course, you know, Brazilian media. But I'm just kind of curious, uh, as an outsider looking in, what has your impression been about? You know, I don't know how much you know about this uh, so-called opposition politician who who died last week under you know sketchy circumstances in a prison where he was serving a, a sentence for for various crimes. Uh, some of them linked to to corruption, but obviously the the type of Western media coverage we're receiving and reality may or may not be two very very different things. So I'm just curious before we get into it, what your impression is as sort of like an outsider. Well, okay, so uh, I'm going to start with a, with a bit of background. Until I would say maybe three four months ago, I had no idea who Navalny was. I had never heard about the guy. You're probably um, in the same boat as many other people, much like people haven't heard of what Ukraine is. Uh, we're now exactly. in a situation, unless they really have been plugged into the news, and then they're sort of like political junkies, um, you know, exactly. not, not on your radar. Okay, so what have you learned? So uh, what have I learned? Well, well, I cannot tell from mainstream media, mainstream media because I'm not a mainstream media guy. Mm -hmm. uh, that much. So yeah, what I look around is, you know, the the the, the usual things, you know, Twitter and, uh, well, some uh, secondary channels or some uh, uh, not mainstream cha channels. Mm -hmm. And so the, the case for me was very clear that the guy was a, a tool for the West, you know, and uh, the, in an attempt for color revolution at a certain period of time, and also that he was completely irrelevant for Russia itself. So that's that's what I learned recently. That's because I searched about the the subject. That's most of people don't do. People watch CNN. And if people, people go on Wikipedia, much like we were discussing just before we we launched exactly. this episode, it's much much it's much different. Now I didn't even dare to go into the English speaking Wikipedia because we kind of know what it's going to be like. Have you dared to do that? So no, <laughs> yeah, of course I, I, <laughs> of I course. look there, and what? So the the first thing. So I will uh, give you another perspective, which is my friends. You know the 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 WhatsApp groups of friends of uh, you know older times, school and stuff like that. First thing was that you know all the the news that Navalny had died and Putin did it and all that that stuff. Mm -hmm. And people are like, yeah, that's how it's done in Russia, you know? And well, so that that kind of gives you a temperature of, um, I would not say even average people, because that's, um, I'm talking about very smart people that I know, but still the... the but, I mean, they the might main... be smart in, in, a, in a certain, you know, like they might be very intelligent scientists or engineers, but they may be kind of naive, um, 
about foreign policy, international relations, propaganda, those types of things, right? People can be sort of have a high intelligence level in a certain, according to certain parameters and be completely just, you know, just ignorant or naive for, you know, the lack of a better word in other, in other situations, which I, you know, I certainly have family members like that. So it's, and I know people like that socially as well. So I think that's relevant. That's exactly the point. One thing that I always say here on, on, on our channel, the IDM, is that, you know, people have work to do, children to take care of, family, you know, exactly. fun. And you don't have time. You don't have time to search for things. So why do you go? You go to the mainstream newspapers. That, well, uh, you, you have know, your kind pop of up, hubs. right? Your news, news, news sort of aggregate on your phone, right? That pops up and it shows you an exactly. overview for that day. At least in exactly. US and Canada, that's what you get. And it's giving you all the selected headlines and little blurbs. And yes, people who are very busy, which most of us are, that's kind of what they're getting. So, you know, unless you really have that deeper interest in a particular subject, and even then, th that doesn't make you immune from sort of extreme levels of propaganda. But, you know, that was kind of my, my attempt. This is why I went on the Russian language Wikipedia to sort of gauge the atmosphere. And of course, you know, we know Wikipedia is obviously hasn't been an objective source of information and has been selectively edited and this has all been discussed by by other people so i think people who would be watching this would be aware of this but i was just kind of amazed uh, the russian language wikipedia was just dominated by citation to mainstream western media but it was all in english all the citation that i was looking i mean it's a huge page so i haven't checked every single uh every, every single footnote but the ones i was clicking on was you know, New York Times in English. So like, what is the expectation here? A Russian who is casually perusing Wikipedia is gonna go and have perfect English to, to read these sources. It was dominated by, you know, quotes from Zelensky. It was just absolutely outrageous. I mean, just my perception, again, I haven't looked at the whole thing, was that there were more English language sources than Russian language sources. And then the Russian language sources were very selective too. There was one sort of, quasi opposition paper that they, they kept referring to because it always portrayed Navalny in a very positive light over over the long term. So of course there was not a, anything to challenge it there, uh, even for as like, you know how sometimes Wikipedia has criticism for, for figures from the past. And then there's, well, sometimes modern figures too. And then there's sort of a little bit of information. Well, these people, these pundits say this, but these other pundits disagree with them. And it was, you know, it was really kind of crazy. And then, of course, the other major Russian language source was Medusa, which is, you know, funded by the um, ex-oligarch uh, Khodorkovsky. And it's, it's, it's run out of the, the Baltic or somewhere else, and somewhere else in Europe these days. So it was very, very selective. I mean, again, from what I've seen, I haven't seen every single source. It was definitely not only trying to create a, a particular perception, but the fact that it kept linking to English language sources just kind of blew my mind. It wasn't even like translations of, of these sources that do exist uh, you know, pretty frequently on, on major Russian websites. Um, yeah, so there was definitely, and again, it's not like Russians would go to Wikipedia as their first source of information, but there's definitely that attempt. And it might also be targeting Russians, the Russian diaspora, right, living abroad that may be reading this in English, but they may be living somewhere else as well. And this is what they would be accessing. And uh, the, the level of skewed was just beyond the usual Wikipedia with all this uh, English language citation. And of course, it's just been very recently updated, right? If it's, if it's introducing very recent quotes in the last week, right, by, mm -hmm. by various politicians. And the other thing that this article was doing, it would make these very generic statements about the quote unquote political persecution of Navalny. And it would talk about, uh, you know, multiple politicians and pundits have concluded. And then you click on the link and it's like one guy and it would be some uber russophobic politician somewhere or it would be one of those um russian liberals that now live in in the west like you know the former chess player kasparov which is in my opinion he's kind of a clown and that would be that would be the source for many politicians and pundits would be like one guy maybe two guys so it was really just kind of outrageous and obviously most people are not going to go through this little not quite a deep dive but a little bit you know more of an investigation of the sources than than usual uh, but I definitely would not expect so many English language sources on uh, a Russian language Wikipedia. 
And then when you go deeper into the specific articles, because it's a huge article, that are also in Wikipedia, those are more balanced. So as yeah. soon as you start going deeper, so, so the expectation here is the initial, like most people are not going to go through all the articles. They're going to read the one page, right? And so the expectation is like, this is what they're going to read. This is the thing that has to impact them the most. But the other ones are sort of like semi-okay. At least there is a little bit of a more balanced source base for those articles. So it, it was just amazing to me, even though I know all this stuff already, you know, so... Yeah, no, exactly. And um, th this is very interesting because when we started the project here, um, me and David, me and Davidson, we were talking a lot about this, uh, about this thing. And, you know, one of the, I'll give you an example of our side here, Davidson, who is someone that is not an average person when it comes to geopolitics. It's someone that uh, uh, actually uh, goes around and search stuff. And you should uh, mention that he does reside in Brazil, right? That you're in Europe. Yeah, exactly. He does so, so it, it is kind of international in that sense. Exactly. But in, in any case, he's not someone that's going to live by the, the mainstream media. So he's going always to, to search on, uh, on separate uh, sources. Plus, he has some knowledge of, uh, of uh, history. So I'll give you an example that's not Navalny itself, but uh, which was the Russia Gates. When we were dis discussing about the Russia Gates, you know, his position was that um, uh, how, how can I say? It, 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 so it, what he was thinking was that, OK, two can play this game. You understand what I mean? So yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the Putin was was actually putting his finger on the on the American um, election, and then years later we find out that. Uh, and he had a very interesting, you know, he had disclosed a very interesting theory, you know, aluminum file hats about that, but, but perfect actually. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I just came to him and said, "Look." That theory is fantastic and it works perfectly, but you have to assume that the Russia Gates happened. Yes, exactly. There has to be a, a base assumption. The, the, base, yeah. as a, the base assumption should be that it actually happened. Mm -hmm. So all that it's okay, but that not needed to be had uh, to happen. And now we know that well, it's been the bugs. Yeah, it's been the bugs. I would not say that. I would not assume that uh, Russia or China or whoever, they are not playing their, uh, their game as well. Mm -hmm. right. But we understood now that that was all uh, a thing by the Democrats and Hillary and all those guys. So when, when, when it comes to Navalny, it does not, uh, is not different. You know, mm -hmm. people like him, we're going to say, <laughs> you know, the Putin put his hand there. Well, right. why he should, yeah, you know why he should, and why you know we talked about as, as sort of right the the general introduction, right? This is this is a supposed oppositionist who has never gained more than around two percent. I mean, it might be a little bit higher in sort of the broad scale Russia landscape. There was one case where he Navalny did do well, and that was the municipal election in Moscow, right, in twenty thirteen. Uh, he actually did do well. He gained just over a quarter of the votes, which is, you know, that's impressive. Let's give him credit where credit is due. But at the same time, we have to consider that Moscow in some ways is representative of Russia and in other ways it's not, right? It's, it's kind of a complex question. We just had this debate on, on X a few weeks ago, uh, whether capital cities and you know metropolitan areas, to the extent to which they represent the periphery. But... Definitely the demographic there that would vote for someone like Navalny would be sort of younger people. It's not going to be, you know, pensioners and, and so on and so forth. So, but yeah, let's give them where credit is, credit where credit is due. But as far as sort of the, the broad landscape, this was not a uh, serious politician that could challenge any of the, let's say, sitting party members in, you know, United Russia or something like that for all of Russia. So um, some of the statistics that I think we've seen are sort of around 2%, maybe around a, a little bit higher. So that's not a serious, um, someone who could seriously really challenge um, sort of the, the, do the dominant political forces in Russia. So then we, so we can sort of go back to the 2018 election, and we discussed this elsewhere, where just a month before, not even a month, it was weeks before that election in the spring of 2018 in Russia, in which, of course, Putin was running too, 
there was that so-called poisoning of the, the Skripal family, right, in London. Mm -hmm. And no one has seen him since. There was all this hoopla and all this, you know, Putin used this uh, battle agent or whatever chemical, no, maybe chosen. And they gave it this really ridiculous name, right? Novichok meaning like someone who is new, but it sounds very kind of like Soviet spy movie type type thing that would definitely feed into, um, you know, the, 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 the Cold War narratives that have never fully gone away. And, mm -hmm. and, and again, the, and of course that sort of damped, dampened the, the tone of the election because there was all this, you know, negative publicity, of course, in, you know, expectedly in the Western media echo, ch echo, ch echo chamber. No, yeah. I'm just like, which language am I speaking now? <laughs> echo chamber, yes. Oh. Ecosystem, but echo chamber, yes, in the, West, in the Western media echo chamber. And of course, we haven't heard from the Skripal family since. So no one's really been able to interview them. And it's just kind of like, well, that's really curious. And at the same time now, right, the Russian election is coming up in March. So again, it's just just about a month prior to this big election. Uh, it's the middle of a, this, this major geopolitical change. It's in the middle of the Ukraine war. Now, obviously, there is also war happening in the Middle East that is major. But in terms of what impacts Russia more directly, it's the, you know, the Ukrainian situation uh, because Russia is the direct participant. And all of a sudden we have the so-called you know opposition leader at least as this is what has been lauded as in the western media for years he he dies under you know sketchy circumstances now you know again we could put in put on our tinfoil hats in a moment but if you kind of think about putin's po uh, popularity has been high in the, in both cases and he's sort of riding this wave of popularity and in each case, just a month before the election, he just decides, I'm just going to ruin it for myself. I'm going to press the button and I'm going to have these guys, you know, these guys killed. Uh, and it, right, it doesn't matter whether they're half the world away, right, uh, across the ocean in London or, it doesn't, or in, in Russia, he's going he's, he's gonna to do it. So it's like, if you're abroad, you can be killed by Putin. If you're in Russia, you can be killed by Putin. So basically, you know, much like we said earlier, like just, just let yeah. me die in peace. But um, yeah, it's just, it doesn't really make sense logically in, in that sense. Even before we get into any kind of tinfoil hat figures of who would benefit from, uh, from this situation. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. just kind of remarkable. The timing is remarkable. Yeah, What's, uh, what I think is very interesting is that, you know, as you said, the, uh, the, the Putin has uh, his hand on Moscow or all Russia London. and then in London and then in the mm -hmm. United States election and so and then Hungary I, and then France mm -hmm. I think yeah I think it's time for panicking because you know Russia just you know dominate the planet why are you guys trying to fight for the the the, the, the Putin can do everything he anywhere can just, yeah, so. he can just he can just send psychic messages yeah, and, uh, yeah, exactly. Soon enough, he'll be doing that. Uh, someone will say that he's controlling the, the fragile Biden's brain or whatever. And it's it's very interesting that uh, this Navalny case. But let's try to... to go back. We'll, we'll pull another the, Putin. Another we'll go back. Yeah, let's go back a little bit on time from the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's one point that uh, we discussed several times here in the channel, not only with you, but with other people from other parts of the of the planet as well and you know uh, when you wrote me uh, when we were discussing this idea about this this show uh, you wrote this this point of the USSR collapse and the the vacuum the ide ideological vacuum mm -hmm. and that that is a it's a fertile soil for you know crazy people starting to rise from from nowhere. So can you please uh, explain me a little bit about this, uh, this yeah, so moment? The reason, the reason why we talked about going back to the 90s and the 2000s uh, in the first place is because we know that Navalny has also been linked to these kind of you know, really extreme nationalist type movements that existed in Russia, right? There are these videos and statements of him circulating, going to the so-called Russian march. And that's kind of a, you know, a nationalist event. And I would kind of, in, in my perception of it, it's kind of like a dog breakfast of ideologies uh, because you would have people who are sort of anti-Soviet monarchists, but at the same time... Mm -hmm. 
Just a second. I have your video is very bad. I'm going just to restart your Sorry. camera. Okay, it seems better, I guess. I guess that doesn't sound very promising. <laughs> yeah, but it's going. It's, it's much better, in fact. Okay, perfect. So, okay. Um, so Sorry. there was there's this discrepancy between you know people that are sort of plugged into politics and they're looking at information that is below the surface of the MSM, right? And so they, you know, obviously Russians know this, but these Westerners found, you know, video, videos of Navalny comparing supposedly, right, Muslims to cockroaches and just really kind of by, by Western standards, really extreme stuff. And so, you know, he would go to this, he would attend the so-called Russian march. Like I said, it's kind of a dog breakfast of ideologies in my perception. Some people may disagree. So you would have anti-Soviet monarchists. You would have more of these kind of um, um, nationalists. You know, some people call them Nazis. You kind of have all these different elements at this one event. And his his call was at this time, uh, he kind of tuned into uh, things that some people, you know, kind of this, uh, maybe not every Russian, but some Russians would say a slogan, stop feeding the Caucasus. And that had to do with the amount of money that was going to um, sort of in the context of the two Chechen wars that were going on at the time, fighting terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why, uh, because there's this undercurrent that does exist in the Western areas. I mean, you can jump on some Western media and you can find it I mean, maybe on like the Salon or something, uh, not maybe in the New York Times, but it's definitely there. And so we kind of wanted to examine that a little bit too. Uh, before we can talk about uh, Navalny's other actions. And to understand that, we have to go back to the 90s, right? So we talked about the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, by now a few times, because it's sort of this pivotal moment that frames a lot of things that are happening right now. Uh, it's been called this peaceful, peaceful revolution, right? Peaceful change of one government to another. But of course, it was nothing but peaceful uh, we're, we're still seeing the aftermath right now, right, in the case of Ukraine, and that's how many years later, right, that's um, 30 years later, and there was all this other stuff that has been generally ignored because that, that narrative has really been um, whitewashed because the importation of neo neoliberalism into Russia that caused tremendous socio socioeconomic suffering, right, that's really not discussed much by um, mainstream mainstream pundits in the you know the official West. So basically, you have this economic collapse, not just in in Russia, but also in sort of the former Soviet republics. To to various extents, people are struggling to survive. There's this huge brain drain, right? This is when my 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 family leaves. There's other types of immigration as well. And against this backdrop, of course, there is now this ideological vacuum. And so when people are struggling to survive, including the government, and trying to implement these insane neoliberal policies, they're less concerned about explicit ideology. And of course, when you have this vacuum, something has to come in. And this is interesting in two ways. Now, first of all, when the Soviet system collapsed, the, in my opinion, the pendulum swung way far in the other direction. I think it's understandable that people really were questioning the entire Soviet experience. Some of them had very negative uh, perceptions of it. Um, no doubt the negative, negative perceptions were colored by the economic hardship that they were going through. Um, but that, so, so that's sort of one part of it. You, you had this rise of people that were entirely rejecting the 70 something years of the Soviet Union. Instead of looking at it in a more balanced way, well, this is, you know, we had Imperial Russia, which had positive and negative features. We had the Soviet Union, which had different positive and negative features. And now we have post Soviet Russia, right? It was really not balanced at all. Some people still have this opinion, but they're in the minority. So this is where you have. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'll give you a moment. Go ahead, please. Okay. So this is this is basically right the the ideological environment. Um, you had people who became monarchists who wanted to just go back to at least the ideology of the, you know, the late Russian empire uh, and to resurrect it in a certain way. They viewed it in an excessively positive way while disregarding the negatives. You had these 
um, sort of more extreme nationalists that wanted to focus on like the, the ethno-nationalist features of Rus the Russian ethnicity, which of course is difficult and very problematic, right? In a multicultural country that has approximately 190 different ethnicities, right? It's a problem uh, for many reasons. And um, you also had the, um, remember the Soviet Union was officially an atheist state and it was very secular, which didn't mean that religion went away, right? We talked about the existence of orthodoxy, right? Quasi-officially, uh, especially since Stalin sanctioned it since World War II. And of course, you had these um, these parts of the Soviet Union that were Muslim, but they were definitely, you know, practicing practicing their religion sort of in a kind of rural settings, but not in a you know sec in a secular atheist officially atheist state to the same extent that you would in a um, a state that doesn't have that type of ideology. So all of that stuff started to come back, and you would say, well, isn't that great that there is this resurgence of uh, older traditions okay i think i lost you let me know if you're back because okay. i can only see my oh i can see you again perfect no worries technology is amazing <laughs> yeah. i'm still fighting so, with the quality of the camera but it's okay the, the important is the content we <laughs> we are slowly learning here <laughs> <laughs> no worries we're in different parts of the world as well so that's i think that's understandable but basically uh on the surface, you say, well, isn't that great that people are rediscovering their religious traditions and embracing them once again? But the problem was that there was this importation of extremist ideologies like Wahhabism and Salafism to various parts of country that republics that were no longer part of the Soviet Union, right, in Central Asia, but also in the North Caucasus that remained part of, of the Russian Federation, right? So this was a big problem. So, you know, now that I've sort of gone back and reacquainted myself with that period, right? So, so the 90s to about 2009, so the period of the two Chechen wars, it's really kind of remarkable the extent to which it reminds me of the Syrian situation, even more so than I kind of perceived it before. Now, of course, the the war in Syria didn't come out of social collapse like it's, you know, like the, the, the post-Soviet situation with the Chechen wars did. But this importation of militants from multiple countries uh, is kind of a very interesting parallel to the Syrian situations that you you had. Mm, I mean, you did have some Chechens, of course, right? Because Chechnya was sort of the focal point, plus some of the other um, Northern Caucasus republics like Dagestan, right? But when you start kind of looking at the numbers that even, in, I didn't realize that, I kind of always thought of it as the se second Chechen war being more dominated by uh, by foreign militants kind of in, in important positions of power. But the first Chechen war was too, this is under Yeltsin. And I was looking at the numbers, I think the official statistic was more than a thousand sort of major militants. I was looking at their citizenship, it was like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, et cetera, Afghanistan. So it was just like this huge list, uh, which was really very, very, very telling in terms of Mm, you know, how the Western media really portrayed it as these freedom fighters, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Rebelling against against Russia and rediscovering themselves. But in reality, there was this really important foreign element that was coming into, into play. It was people who were not even born in Chechnya, right? Coming there specifically to fight. And they were importing this mm, really, well, I would say a set of extremist ideologies, right? So that's kind of another thing that filled... Uh, the vacuum in certain parts of the Russian Federation. And the Chechen wars, you know, I don't want to go too much into this. It's a complex topic, but basically you kind of had the, the latter part of the 90s, right, with, with Yeltsin uh, embroiled in, in the first Chechen war. And the interesting thing is that um, Western media coverage was a little bit nicer to Yeltsin because he was the darling of the West than the second Chechen war when, you know, the Russians were evil and bad. Uh, now, of course, the two, both, both wars were awful because this was mostly urban warfare, right? So in urban warfare, you're going to have um, suffering that involves civilians. And there were multiple uh, awful acts of, of terrorism uh, involving you know, capture of a hospital in 1995, where, you know, the death toll was probably uh, about a quarter of the hostages, right? Schools, like it was just not like they were fighting the Russian police or something like that, the federal forces, which happened too. And there are many, uh, many, many terrorist acts that involved the sort of the 
<laughs> Again, it's like it, they're described as the government forces. It makes me think of like the Assad government forces in Syria. It's just mm -hmm. kind of amazing how that's being described too, you know, many, many years later. But um, there were acts of terrorism pertaining, you know, targeting just absolutely innocent civilians like, you know, sick people in a hospital and, and children, right, in a school. Just really, really awful things. So that's another feature here. So out of this sort of mishmash of different movements and ideologies and ways of thinking comes someone like Navalny, right? So it's one of the reasons, you know, these acts of terrorism, one of the, this is one of the reasons why there was a certain level of anti-Muslim, you know, sentiment in, in certain parts of Russia. Now, of course, it's unfair to, you know, we, it's to us, it's obvious that it's unfair to think of an entire large religious group, uh, judging them by the acts of a small group of extremists that, you know, the, the larger group is not practicing these beliefs. But nonetheless, it's something we've seen, right? We've seen in, in the U.S. since 9-11, uh, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's just an unfortunate thing that happens and it requires education, et cetera, et cetera. But regardless, Navalny in that sense, in his sentiment, was not alone. He was not the only person that would make statements like stop feeding the Caucasus, right? And again, when he would say stop feeding the Caucasus, other people would say this too. And this was about the amount of money that was going to the Caucasus, right? To the, the Chechen war, the second Chechen war, right, was fought under Putin. And uh, also just the funding that was going on to later the revival of, of Chechnya and, you know, the other republics in the North Caucasus, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there was definitely this Mm, xenophobic, not so much an undercurrent. It was very much in public among certain parts of the population. It was sort of colored by these awful acts of terrorism. And unfortunately, this was the perception in, in you know, some, some parts of the, the Russian community. So he was sort of not alone in that sense. But to me, the interesting thing is that none of that, I mean, he has made some statements that by today's Western standards, like, you know, comparing people to cockroaches uh, is, is a little bit outrageous, to say the least. Um, this is what's made... Mm -hmm. Kind of remind me of the, 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 the penis piano player, you know, comparing the Turks <laughs> with cockroaches. Yes, well, he's Just made saying. many. He's made many. He's made many comparisons, I think, since. I, wait, 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 I lost mm -hmm. your image. OK, OK, you're back. Sorry. Yeah, we can definitely talk about the instrumentalization of these kind of more extreme undercurrents by the official West, which subscribes to kind of this happy kittens and puppies and human rights ideology. But of course, human rights only applies to a select group of people, not uh, everyone. So we can definitely talk about the, you know, the Ukrainian situation and someone like Navalny. But, you know, that kind of that part of his biography is not really in the Western media. Here and there, you can find pieces, like I said, you know, something like the Salon, maybe in a couple of other publications, but definitely it's completely left out. So uh, then, you know, then you have a couple of questions. First of all, if you are a, a foreign intelligence agency, is there really no one better than this guy? Can't you find someone with a little bit of a cleaner biography, a little bit more clean cut to use as your, uh, as your project, project for, um, trying to push for a color revolution. So that's that's interesting, right? Why are you going for this guy? Um, second of all, when you, again, go into this Russian Wikipedia, that part is pretty much absent on it. Uh, but it talks about his other pursuits in that same time period, so sort of the mid uh, 2000s to about 2010. And it talks about all of his involvement and all of these sort of liberal-ish parties, pro-Western liberals, kind of minority parties, like there's, you know, this, this party that was called the Apple Party, right, Yabloka, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's a long list. So he was doing all of these things, uh, but his involvement in kind of more, you know, ex extreme nationalist events like the Russian March is just not not there. So it's kind of, it's definitely giving you more of a skewed perception, but at the same time, it's very interesting how he was simultaneously going after very different ideologies, so, which to me seems very opportunistic even before he started participating in politics on a broader scale. Like, why are you simultaneously this human rights, you know, rainbows and puppies and kittens liberal and pro-Western liberal, right? And we know what the official ideology is and sounds good on paper, right? And at the same time, you're going to this 
uh, into a, you know Russian march only ethno like ethno nationalist march and you're talking you know comparing groups of people to cockroaches. It's, it's just very interesting how it all was happening at the same time. And uh, at one point, it wasn't at this time, but it was the last time he was in the news, and I can't remember when this was. I was looking at the social media of some of these other prominent figures into that general into sort of in that general movement of these. Um, I, I don't know, it's hard for me to call them nationalists. Some of them are ethno-nationalists. They're not super extreme. Some of them are more like monarchists, anti-Soviet monarchists. I don't want to name any names, but some of them are sort of prominent figures that are still active. And um, I, I wanted to see what they were saying. And I think I actually accidentally came across what they were saying about Navalny. And they said, you know, before of his involvement in these sort of color revolutionary scenarios, he was an okay guy, but he was really full of himself. He was really kind of like narcissistic. Uh, in terms of attention seeking. And to me, again, I know it's anecdotal, it's you know, a couple of people's perception, but people who knew him personally in, in the mid-2000s. So I thought it was really interesting because it really aligns with what I would think of a person like this, someone very opportunistic and attention seeking and kind of disregarding perhaps um, a certain level of danger when you would be involved in that kind of in, in those types of activities, but also um, wanting that attention. And if you kind of look at his attempts to get into Russian politics, he was like any means necessary protest running for this type of government, working for this guy in Russian politics, um, trying to become the mayor, trying to become the president. It was all and it was all kind of in a short uh, time period, usually in more kind of Western politics, there's a little bit slower of a tra trajectory, right, of people sort of rising to power. I mean, there are definitely some exceptions with these uh, European middle managers, right, that we um, often mention. Uh, but it was it was really interesting to me that really sort of solidifies my perception of him as being this opportunist who for whom access to power was more important than a particular ideology and he could kind of be this chameleon and change his colors whenever, well, here I'm going to cater to these people because they they don't like all this money going to the Caucasus, right? And they don't mm -hmm. like Muslims. But here I'm going to cater to these nice pro-Western liberals and I'm going to talk about, you know, anti-corruption and human rights. So, and it's going to happen all within kind of the same time period. So it's not the case of like, oh, well, he thought this, he realized he was wrong or he changed his views and now he thinks this. That would be more natural, but it wasn't. It was all sort of at the same time. So, Yeah, the thing about this kind of this type of people is that they are ready to whatever. They are not ideal, ideological. They maybe they... Uh, maybe they have some hate or some ideology behind them, but then when they, you know, get uh, recruited as an asset for whatever, uh, they just they, they they first they need to be trained, they need to receive money, and so once they start seeing money, that's a different thing, you know. So this guy may most of these people probably start things uh, in in a sense of ideology, but after the money starts to 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 pump in, ideology goes to the tubes, you know. Poor people yeah. have ide ideology. These rich people have money. It's different. So mm -hmm. go ahead. This 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 kind of uh, shows up uh, what the guy came for, you know. He, he's he having these multifacial uh, uh, attitudes to the current thing, mm -hmm. uh, right? So it's uh, it's it's just it's just like it's Facebook. actually kind of indicative of these democratic politics where you go to one target audience and you tell them one thing, and then you go to a different target audience and you tell them something different. And you're trying to win all these different parts of the, you know, the electorate, right? These, yeah. um, these, these smaller groups, which is kind of not very, you know, not very yeah. honest. But that's exactly. a main feature of democracy today. And and at the same time, you need to keep these people uh, pushing in in groups that are extremely violent toward the government, mm -hmm. uh, like you know neo mustaches and uh, all this type of people you know extremist islam or whatever y you name here whatever has been blowing up things in the last uh, 20 30 40 years mm -hmm. that's where the, those guys needs to be so 
You see the same with uh, with Ukraine. You see the same in Brazil. Uh, you saw the same in Brazil during Bolsonaro election. Mm. Sure. Uh, and not even just Bolsonaro, because uh, most of people, of course, are not uh, following the Brazilian uh, elections. But back at that time, the, the, the Labour Party, which is the party of the actual president of Brazil, Lula da Silva. So Lula was in jail, ha had been jailed. Mm -hmm. Also, it was a, a kind of a coup d'etat uh, uh, on that. It was not a coup d'etat because he was not the president, but he was right. the, the uh, he was going to, to run for president against Bolsonaro. So they jailed him. And back then the, the the labor party has always been you know they have the star with the with the hammer and the the thing that i forgot the name sickle. hammer and sickle yeah sickle exactly you mm -hmm. know kind of communist party or socialist party stuff like that and during the campaign they simply rebranded using the the colors of brazil because you know the the nationalist uh, sentiment was flourishing in brazil at that moment in that it ended up with bolsonaro being elected of course uh, uh, and but you see even whoever they, they just rebrand at any moment. But these people usually rebrand to the current thing, you know, just like right. Facebook, when people put in, you know, Ukraine flags and then yeah. Palestine flags, most of them have no idea what's going on. But, you know, we have to support the current thing. And that's yeah. where those kind of people capitalize. Yes, exactly. And, yeah, it's interesting because I kind of look at him and... Mm, 2000s, he was sort of definitely opportunistic, but he was pursuing maybe his own goals to get into his power by whatever means necessary. But when he got rebranded with the help of multiple foreign powers, that was definitely more of like, I, that's why I call him P Project Navalny, right? I no longer refer to him by his name because he's now this brand and a brand had a particular, a particular purpose. And, you know, we could sort of look at one of the first major events in, 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 in that rebranding is when he went to the Yale World Fellows Program, uh, which is very interesting. And I'm not sure if this is true. I haven't fully fact-checked it, but uh, a bunch of articles say that he was nominated or suggested by that former chess player Kasparov, which is like this massive, uh, well, pro-Western liberal, but also Russophobe. Like he criticized anything and everything about Russia beyond rhyme and reason. I mean, he still does. He actually has had me blocked on Twitter slash X for years. And I'm not even sure if I said anything to him, but he's just so he's just so outrageous. So I thought it was really interesting that if true, like I said, I have not fact checked it. You guys could fact check it for yourselves. He was mm -hmm. one of the major figures to kind of connect him to um, connect Navalny to, uh, you know, to the official West in this in this regard. So, you know, when you go to a program like this, you're obviously receiving more than just um sort of academic training, right? I mean, it's the whole idea of world fellows. It's it's about soft power and maybe about some more nefarious uh, purposes that you, you could sort of draw your own conclusions based on that. The interesting thing about the world fellows thing is that the current Russian um, head of the central bank, right? Uh, I was always kind of skeptical of her because she went through the same, you know, the same institution. And I was That's a little bit, either. yes, exactly. I was a bit you know, knowing what we know about Navalny, when, when I realized that, oh, she's actually has that same background, I was, I was worried. And I mean, I think in some ways she can be criticized, but what she's done in the last few years, right, essentially uh, balancing the Russian economy and actually it's doing very, very well uh, from, from that aspect of the, you know, ruling the central bank. I think it's really interesting that I don't think she fulfilled whatever, uh, her overlords, right? Her her mentors, and that's let's not say overlords. Her mentors, her academic <laughs> mentors, uh, wanted for for her to do. But it's isn't it interesting having that kind of person in the central bank of a country, like the most important financial wow. institution? Oh my goodness! I know it's not exceptional, but when you kind of see it in the open, you're like, oh, they're very very fascinating, right? So, uh, well. You know, a very smart person would have some very smart person from its country going outside to learn what the other country thinks about. Yes. And, well, you know, putting his KGB, so... <laughs> right. Yes. No, be... but, but, you know, I guess that tells you that not everyone is an opportunist who is hungry for, for money and power and by any means necessary. And some people are 
actually professionals doing doing their job. But I definitely was skeptical of her because of that Navalny um, Navalny link to to that program. But it's interesting. So we should also mention a little bit of all these corruption cases that were brought against him. Uh, there are at least three, but there there, there possibly are some other ones. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Russian legal system. Uh, all of these cases had to do with things like theft of property, fraud, you know, that type of that type of corruption. And mm, whenever it's brought up in you know the Western media, it's usually mentioned as this. Well, of course, it's political persecution. Um, but there are a couple of interesting things about that. Well, first of all, Navalny, as soon as he graduated from, from law school, he started, he got involved in various types of businesses. And, you know, in, in the 90s in Russia, business, the business world was just madness, right? People could get rich really quick. This is when you had this rise of these oligarchs, also known as billionaires in the West by a nice name, but in Russia, they're oligarchs. For some reason, they're different somehow, even though it's, you know, the exact same no, no, no. thing. If they are Western, they are billionaires in the West. Yes. If they are and Russian, they are oligarchs. Yeah, if they're Western, they're billionaires and philanthropists. If they're Russian, they're, oh, yeah. they're oligarchs. We can't, we have to differentiate, because it's a different thing. It's kind of like that Russian meme, it's different. We, lo we love that meme. Yeah, so it's different. But yeah, so you kind of had this wild west of, you know, just imagine having this capitalist madness of neoliberalism introduced to a, a, what used to be a state controlled centralized economy, right? You're going to have um, an insane level of criminality going on and corruption in, in that world. Eventually, you know, Putin, maybe not perfectly, but he cracked down on uh, not just those uh, economic oversights, but also just the, the power of the oligarchs in, in politics as well. Um, but basically, of course, Navalny was sort of youngish when he was, you know, in the 90s. I think he was born, what, let me check, 1976 or something like that. But uh, in the 2000s, he was definitely operating and launching all these businesses, sometimes working with family members. So he was definitely in that world. And so I would actually not be surprised. I haven't investigated these corruption cases in detail, but that something may have been going on because other people were doing things that were illegal, right? Uh, in this sort of sketchy gray area period. So, um, and I, I was looking at the first, the first charges of corruption where he actually re uh, received a uh, criminal sentence. And then the, the sentence was commuted to, uh, what is the, I'm sort of glitching on my English when you, uh, you don't have to go to jail for it. Like you have that sentence, but it's basically uh, yeah, like, um, uh, parole or something like that. A parole. It's like when you don't have to go to jail at all. So it's like you have that sentence, but I might, sorry, my, I'm <laughs> four hours you, of sleep, you, you right? You pay a fine or so, something like that. No, no, no. You, you still have that jail sentence, but you never are actually in, in jail. I'll, it'll come to me after the show and it'll be like, oh my God, I, I watch so much true crime when I clean the house and I totally We're forgot what put, the, uh, the word on the description. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, it was, well, his sentence was basically commuted to not having to be uh, in, in prison at all, which is also kind of interesting because it happened after that, some of those massive protests in Russia. So then the question is, if he was such a threat, why is this Russian court that is supposedly controlled by Putin single-handedly pressing you know, buttons, why is it releasing him into the wild to do all this stuff, right? Again, it doesn't quite match up. And I know that Navalny and his lawyers uh, made multiple complaints to the, I think it was the European Court of Human Rights. And I think the first complaint basically concluded that, um, I think it was something like his human rights were violated, but there's no, um, there is no political basis. Like he was not persecuted politically. I think it changed with like the next, the next corruption cases, but the initial case uh, did not conclude that it was political, which I think is very interesting. When you start looking at those details, it's much more nuanced than the picture that is presented in the West. Now, is it possible that he was being, if these cases were pursued more rigorously than cases against other people that were engaged in other types of criminal activities when it comes to business? It's possible, but is it done to sort of like, out of fear that this man is just going to come and rule Russia? I don't think so, because again, he's never really, other than that Moscow election that he lost, right? He did, he just did, did place well. He never really had broad support in Russia. It was very, very specific. Um, so, you know, that's definitely very, very noteworthy. You're not, you're not going to find that specificity in, um, in the Western media. Mm -hmm. 
Plus, he was um, he just left uh, Russia, and he was told not to come back. What, maybe that's the word you're looking for. No, um, when you are oh, well, uh, just, like in a island or that. something like that. Um, okay, it says a suspended sentence, but I think there is a better word than a suspended sentence. Is what I was talking about. Um, basically, it's like an alternative to uh, imprisoning someone. Okay. But in any case, he was not living in Russia, and then he was uh, convicted, and he, well, he was, was going he to did, be jailed. Mm -hmm. right. he, yeah. he did participate, right, in, in those massive, you know, protest, protests in 2012-ish. And that's another thing that I feel like those were definitely major events. It wasn't it was an attempt at a color revolution in Russia. If you look at the way it was being described, they were trying to call it the snow revolution, right? So yeah. we had the rose revolution in Georgia. We had the, you know, 2003. We had the orange revolution in uh, Ukraine, right? The first one before the Maidan in 2004. And so now these 2011, 2012, sort of going into 2013, they were trying to really, really, really hard to brand it as the snow revolution in russia and fail and wasn't like the wasn't the hong kong one wasn't it like the umbrella jasmine, uh, the, the the jasmine revolution if i'm not mistaken or that was taiwan which one was the umbrella the, revolution? that was, was the umbrella to... well yeah i just yes, had this with the, angela the, 20... the other day Yes, the 2014 Hong Kong pro protests were called the umbrella movement. So yeah, there is always this sexy word that they're trying to use, you know, the powers that be to, to brand this thing so then they can use it in all the media and everyone will know mm -hmm. what is being referred to. So it was definitely a serious situation. And I would say there are sort of multiple factors in play. Remember 2008 going into 2009, there was a major, major economic downturn because of the, the banking crisis on Wall Street. Um, it was more major in the U.S., I would say, than maybe in Canada, but lots and lots of people lost their jobs. Of course, the U.S. being the economic hegemon, of, you know, in the world, that that crisis impacted other countries, obviously, right? Because the dollar is the reserve currency. Um, the U.S. at this time was the, the one economic giant. Now we have China. So there was also an economic downturn in Russia. So definitely people were sort of not very happy with uh, the situation there from, from that person, or some people were not satisfied with the econo or socioeconomics uh, from that perspective. Uh, you also had, it was actually that late that the Second Chechen War wrapped, wrapped up, right? So you had this decade where uh, things were sort of cooling down in terms of um, not just the fighting in, in the North Caucasus, uh, but also just the, the sheer number of acts of terrorism, but they were not completely absent. So you kind of have this, you know, 1994-ish to 2009, a long period of just, not just, you know, war, but also multiple acts of terrorism. And so you're always living in this heightened sense of, well, maybe not everyone, but some people in this heightened sense of alertness, right? Uh, and I even remember back then, people were like, are you sure you want to travel to visit family? Because you can be blown up on the subway, right? So there was definitely that, there was definitely that sentiment, you know, like, well, are you careful walking around downtown, you know, whatever, Moscow, St. Petersburg, because you can just, they could just, you know, there could be a, an act of terrorism there. So there was definitely that awareness, right? So there was also that, that feature too. And Yes, there was also this dissatisfaction with certain mm, local, sort of more regional authorities. Uh, obviously, in a large country like Russia, not every single governor, you know, mayor, uh, business owner is going to be this absolute paragon of virtue, right? There definitely are going to be some cases of corruption, just like uh, anywhere else. So, you know, when you when you live somewhere, right, you are going to pay attention to those local problems, right? So, you're one. Mm -hmm. It's natural for you to to want to change those. So, you know, if I am a uh, a Russian uh, living in the West, I'm going to be paying attention to my immediate, uh, you know, ice that hasn't been cleaned up and I don't want to fall down. You know, something could be something as trivial as that. It could be something more, uh, more significant, like, you know, the taxes are not being spent properly on, you know, municipal services, whatever, just very natural. So there was also that, there was, there, there was that sentiment of corruption. And of course you had foreign you know, NGOs that were still very much active in Russia, really, really, really playing it up. Uh, so that was sort of like 
the background for those uh, protests in, in you know, large cities, essentially. And usually there are multiple reasons, right, for such, for such protests. But it was definitely a serious attempt to carry out a color revolution. Like I said, they even picked a name. It just didn't go through. Uh, and Navalny was definitely involved in that in a, on, you know, in a serious way. And yes, he's been doing a lot of sort of in the 2010 to 2020, he's been doing a lot of traveling uh, between the official West. Uh, you know, we all saw the clip of one of his major, you know, right hand, right hand men uh, meeting with an agent with uh, an agency, a certain agency, three letter, three, two letter, one number agency from the um, a certain country yeah, that we can, call, <laughs> we can call it Albion, right? And, um, you know, this person is, uh, this was not Navalny himself, but it was someone closely linked to him, right? He was asking for a lot of funding for yeah, such... It, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was very interesting because that it, it was this kind of outrage from the mass media that, oh, uh, that it's circulating this video accusing but it's Navalny, actually not Navalny, but it's not it's just, Navalny. It's just his uh, right-hand uh, man or his one of his operatives, right? Someone linked to his, linked to one of his uh, organizations, right? So... Um, yeah, it's almost like, do you really need to be that specific? And sometimes that's how people like to debunk things, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyway. But mm -hmm. if is the Panama Papers, you know, someone that is uh, no, that had the dinner once with the cousin of someone that works for the Putin. <laughs> the cousin of the ex-husband of the uh, second, second, <laughs> second wife. Of... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then so that's, that's, that's very, very Putin. serious. Yes, it's very serious. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's really interesting. And then, of course, he tried to uh, participate in the 2018 uh, election, in the presidential election in Russia. That's the one, right, we referred to previously with the uh, Skripal poisoning, right, the ex, um, mm -hmm. what is he, the ex-spy, I guess, who, who lived in London, right, of all places, this is where you decide to go. Do you think good things are going to happen to you there? Probably not. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. But, I mean, the very fact that he came back uh, to uh, a country where he was, despite his criminal record, he was allowed to participate in these elections, I think that also says something about uh, the Russian government. Why didn't they just, you know, not shut allow him, him to do that? Why didn't they shut him down? Here. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, at that just, moment. It's almost like, what is this? Uh, this doesn't quite fit, fit that narrative, right? It's a much, much, much more nuanced. And in, you know, in those elections, again, this, his, whereas he did well in that 2013 Moscow election, he did not, uh, his, his support was really just minuscule, just not anyone that would be taken seriously. Um, again, it was these hipsterish, urban, younger people. Um, it's actually kind of frustrating to me where he, he, I mean, you can kind of say to what extent is he responsible to luring all these thousands of young people uh, into participating in these sketchy, sketchy protests and stuff like that. I mean, I guess it's kind of an open question. You could say he is the leader. He should be aware of where he's dragging these young people that may or may not ruin their lives, right? Because some of them love taking selfies as they're being arrested because they try to like kick a cop or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah but I think there is some responsibility there too because he... Sure. I mean, some more, some Russians that are much more harsh than I am, they would claim, you know, that he ruined the lives of thousands of young people that were involved in that pro protest movement who could have been benefiting the country in other ways, and even, even if they were addressing certain problems, right, that, that exactly. Russia has, right? So definitely some, some blame is there. And it, that's definitely a sentiment that's quite, uh, quite common, you know, amongst, amongst the average Russian population. And then, of course, there was that um, underwear Novichok, right? Novichok has been, now that it's been tested out on, on Skri the Skripal family, you know, on Skripal and his daughter, it's been revived as this battle agent. And it was, you know, he supposedly was poisoned and it was in his underwear. You know, it's just like... <sighs> It's just a, a, the perfect tabloid headline, right? Like, of no, course people are no going to click on... Now in, uh, you know... Yeah, it's going to be... Yeah, it's just like, who what, comes up with What's the name of this? that in English uh, for kids, you know? Mm, the the you medicine mean? that you put uh, on, 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 on the back of the kid, or on the butt of the kid. Oh, like a, like a di for diaper rash? Yeah, yeah, like, the, like, like, a, like a, just a lotion for diaper rash, yeah. 
Yeah, something like that. I, I was going to say that medicine that you 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 introduce in the in the, in, in the children when they have some you know intestine issues. And okay, I see. okay. Yeah. Well, so it, to me, it's just like now in that. Yeah, it's just like the the perfect tabloid headline, right? It's now that they've introduced this idea of Navichok, and I think previously I did a little bit of an investigation that there are even these TV shows coming out before the Skripal situation where they talk about similar sort of this predictive programming. Yeah, you know, we could kind of go down that rabbit hole at some point. I know other people have done that, but it's not ultimately the biggest, the, the most important point here. But yeah, it was just this perfect made for tabloids headline. And again, evil, you know, Russian government that could have just you know, squashed this mosquito, Navalny, that was annoying them. They allowed him to go to Germany. Right, they allowed him to go to Germany, which is to me, again, is like, how does that fit your narrative of this evil authoritarian tyrant when you're essentially letting him go to, to, uh, you know, undergo medical treatment and how he was really hurt and what he was sick with is definitely an interesting question because um, there are, you know, we, we always say that these people, especially when they're not very successful politically, they become more relevant as a martyr, as a sacrificial lamb right. than for media publicity, for, uh, you know, get, getting money for certain political pursuits in other countries. And, you know, in his in his case, that was that was definitely there. You know, this is my this is my opinion. So he goes to Germany. And the interesting thing is that he's in Germany between August and 2020, January 2021. And if you remember, this was the time when there was a certain illness going around the world and they introduced a certain miracle cure for that illness. So mm, we know that he was in supposedly uh, that cure was introduced to him, right? Multiple times. And we now know that according to multiple sources, right, that there are some medical links between having blood clots, right? and that particular miracle cure. So there's definitely that undercurrent of people, you know, team team, tinfoil hat, thinking of how could he have died, right? The the most recent event Um, in the saga, right? So we can take sort of the, pardon? No, but that's just conspiracy theory. You know, the Daily Beast cracked the case. I don't know if you read it. Of course, they they cracked it before he even died. (laughs) They had it ready to go. (laughs) But it was was the the secret KGB punch, you know? Yeah, oh yeah, I saw the KGB punch. uh, Yeah, like I said, they're making Putin sound a lot cooler than he actually is. (laughs) He's, he's trying to get to he's trying to get to that ninety nine percent you know rating from his whatever eighty or seventy eight percent that he's at now. Yeah, he's definitely trying to get higher up there in the in the the love of the people by introducing the secret KGB judo battle punch or whatever it was, right? So yeah, it's kind of remarkable that this would even be published seriously. But I guess the more outrageous the headline, the more people would read it and believe it perhaps a certain segment of the population might believe it with all the other um sort of disinformation propaganda that has been introduced as well Mm -hmm. but yeah i mean if you kind of i feel like it's i don't know if it's worth analyzing why he may or may, may not have passed away right he was in his late 40s but he was also in prison and he went on a hunger strike right so if you're in a prison in a very cold place i mean the prison is not uh the nicest place to be at the same time i think they um, sometimes exaggerate prisons because they're definitely not like Scandinavian prisons where people like, you know, a certain mass shooter can watch TV and uh, play sports and do all this other fun stuff. But there are other prisons in, you know, in the U.S. that has much, much, much harsher sentences for uh, smaller, smaller crimes. So I think that stereotype of the, the Russian prison is like, in some cases, maybe a certain uh, labor prison might be, you know, when it comes to normal prisoners might, might apply. Um, but at the same time, should prison really be this nice place like in Scandinavia, like in Norway, where they just kind of chill and taxpayers, you know, pay for their nice little vacation away from the world? Uh, probably time. not. But yeah, so he's in this prison. I'm not sure the extent to which life, how harsh life was or wasn't. I'm sure he had special attention because of all that publicity uh, in the West. Uh, but yeah, he went on a hunger strike, and obviously, if you're going on a hunger strike, you're gonna really damage your health, right? That's not a that's not a very nice thing. So, the most uh, sort of non-conspiracy theory explanation here would be he really 
um, he, he really did detrimental things to his health, right? More conspiratorial theories would have to do with where a blood clot, you know, if that, that's what happened, would have come from, right? And then we can go down to the timing, right? That it's just a month before the Russian election. Isn't it interesting that, you know, Putin is riding the wave of popularity, not just in Russia. He had this interview that reached a billion views, which is really unheard of for any politician. Even, you know, most celebrities and musicians don't get that many views. There are only a few examples of that, right? So uh, the timing is definitely very interesting. People can draw their own conclusions uh, about that. But um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's worth kind of looking at the entire trajectory of this man and, um, to go back to his ideology, whether he was an opportunist or he really believed what he was saying in the 2000s, it's that instrumentalization right by the West where they don't really, uh, they might not even care or they might be using, like they would be using the sort of extreme nationalists in Ukraine, right, to sort of put their, put their boot down and uh, sort of use street justice, quote unquote, right, to um, crack down on anyone that would disagree with what's been going on in Ukraine since 2014, whether it's the so-called moderate rebels, right, that would be receiving funding from, from foreign countries, or whether it's someone like Navalny, right? So there is definitely that instrumentalization, and I think that says a lot about the ideology of liberalism, where on the surface it's, you know, we're about human rights, we're about egalitarianism, we're about all kinds of equality, we're about democracy, freedom, blah, 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 you know, rainbows, kittens, puppies, and all the happy things, gumdrops. But then at the same time, for our little dirty deeds elsewhere, we can be using these more extreme elements uh, and in some cases, we can sort of whitewash them and dress them nicely. Or we're going to pick a guy that looks like the young Yeltsin for the, you know, the Russian situation. Uh, in other cases, we're not even going to bother whitewashing them. We're just going to call them moderate rebels because, you know, there are these freedom fighters. So we don't even have to dress them nicely. And, you know, in, in the Ukrainian case, we're just going to call them as, you know, people seeking their liberation from hundreds of centuries, uh, millions of years of Russian oppression, right? So uh, it's very interesting that instrumentalization of other ideologies that in theory would challenge liberalism, but because they're not challenging liberalism on a global scale, these liberal governments uh, do find them useful for their own purposes. It's very, um, very sociopathic, again, in my opinion, to, to do that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that, that's why more or less uh, those things never work out the way they want, because at some point the, these people just say, OK, screw you. I'm going to to listen to this guy now because, you know, we have nothing in common. The thing is that at the same point, uh, at the same time, the, the, the Western oligarchy uh, it's it's very well connected, you know, the values, all the values, they are very well connected with such and such ideology, if you pay attention for a minute. And yeah, that's the, the, what we are discussing just before, you know, these guys are very easily, to, I mean, extremists, uh, extreme thoughts are very easily to, to be, you know, brought up or, or, or to boil on, on society. As you said, of course, you, you need, uh, you have the manual of the coal well, revolution. Yeah, you have, yeah, you have you, fertile you need, soil. You for need, it. Yeah. Exactly, a fertile soil. You need some crisis, you know. Uh, nobody cares if uh, something happened in and the United States. If there's no States crisis, you can engineer a crisis. You can engineer a crisis. You can, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the, the as you mentioned, the, the 2008 uh, USA uh, economic crisis. Bank, yeah, banking crisis. Yeah, banking crisis. Banking crisis. <laughs> it, it, it didn't went that far in Brazil. Brazil did not suffer that much of that. Okay. We at that moment we had a very interesting, you know, a quite solid economy back at that moment. But then, of course, a couple of years later, it reached us. Right. No, but it was not immediate. Mm -hmm. Plus, that was the the, the big thing. The, uh, I don't know if you remember the oil drop because of the what's it called the, the crudes from the United States. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that was the excuse. But right. the, the oil drop price to like thirty dollars, mm -hmm. which was something that was aimed to hurt Russia. Mm -hmm but actually destroyed Brazilian economy because Brazil oil explo uh, exploration is on deep sea and deep yeah. sea oil exploration is very, very expensive. It's expensive. much more expensive yeah. than, yeah. you know, 
make a hole on the ground and uh, and just drill, and yeah. Water goes mm-hmm. out. So that mostly broke the Brazilian economy, and that made a very fertile uh, uh, soil for the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, who was the successor of Lula da Silva at that time. Yeah. And then the rise of uh, figures like Bolsonaro, you know, mm-hmm. and others, among others, okay? Yeah. And it's it, the, what we were discussing before, you know, this exactly this uh, rebranding of Navalny ab- around 2010s, mm-hmm. uh, more or less around the same time, some political parties were born in Brazil. And very sketchy police political right. parties. They they are not very relevant mm-hmm. yet, at least not to the presidential level. But they made a lot of space in you know uh, state level, city level. Um, what's it called? The chamber, the the deputy chamber in Brazil. We have the deputy sure. chamber, mm-hmm. uh, ministerial and stuff like that. Uh, but and very interesting subjects also there. We have that that would be more to discuss with someone from Brazil, and I'm going to point this video and you know someday so we can we sort of check it out. <laughs> yeah, a full week summit of color revolution around the 2010s. And yeah, and, and I guess the question is right: it's whether these things are completely engineered in terms of the crisis or whether. They happen because of some mismanagement, right? Bankers are not exactly known as to be the most um, the most responsible people, right? There's definitely uh, if 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 you know when the 2008 and the in the aftermath, people really talked about the bonuses that uh, you know that some managing director at some bank was getting, how outrageous that was compared to both other lower sort of uh, underlings in the bank, but also in the general population. So you know you could say maybe it was just this mismanagement within mm, the banks, mismanagement within the system of capitalism. You know, you can kind of have different theories about that. But then you could say, you know, this thing happened and it was useful for the powers that be to exploit it and to um, exploit the political situations in countries, you know, ABC, and, and change that internal dynamic to make it more beneficial to, you know, access Russian natural resources, for, you know, for example. So uh, it's definitely... Um, you can kind of go both ways on that question, the extent to which these things are engineered, but I think ultimately it doesn't matter because people end up exploiting them, like people in power, right, end up exploiting them to, um, to their own benefit, to the best of their ability, and it's, it's definitely something to pay attention to. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, so uh, a little bit of uh, trivia from what I get from our fantastic source, Wikipedia, <laughs> so the 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 Sergey and Yulia Skripal uh, poisoning. So first of all, that was a very interesting point that Alex Christoforo raised this week, which mm-hmm. is that uh, this Novachuk, it's extremely deadly, and all yeah, these and, and nothing survived. really, nothing, nothing happened to them. Yeah, I know they just kind of ended up in a hospital. It's just that's always been. I mean, it was the point that was raised when it first came out, and I think people forget because you read about it, and it's supposed to be this you know, battle agent that's supposed to be this awful chemical that was produced, you know, as a chemical weapon. But then in all the cases, whether it's the Novichok in underwear or Novichok on a bench in, in, in somewhere in England, um, none of them really got hurt seriously. It's just kind of remarkable how, how that works, right? So yeah. <laughs> the Russians are incompetent. On I know, chemical. exactly. It's like at the same time, they are controlling the world and all these governments around the world. And then at the same time, they can't, properly kill the opponents in in russia or or in in london right all all roads lead to london yeah, um, yeah most I'm, likely I'm a joke. Uh, uh, most likely navali as uh, according to our uh, chick named dude lindsey graham uh so this guy stood a long time in prison until get, getting murdered right so they, they are really incompetent the russians are really incompetent at killing people <laughs> They let him go to Germany. They let him, right? I just, they sort of dropped the criminal charges. They commuted his sentence, right? They made it into a... They really want to do it, but they're just not... They just can't. Yeah, they just can't. They just don't have... Until finally Putin worked himself up to do the KGB battle punch, right? Um, And 
and now his now his popularity is going back up, right? Not in the West, uh, where he was. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not the role among the Western oligarchs, well, but it certainly it certainly distracted from the billion views, right? Billion plus views on on his in, his recent interview. That was definitely a distraction. So uh, that was that was an interesting uh, interesting coincidence. But it's you know just a coincidence. That, yeah, like just lots another of, like lots of other coincidences. That, yeah, the 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 Avdiivka falls on the same day. And, you know, just a coincidence that uh, Navalny's wife was uh, in Germany and by chance she just, she just you know, tripped and fell inside the, the, the security assembly for, uh, of Munich. And, you know, a lot of coincidences. And by coincidence, next month, next month there's the elections on Russia. Again, just a complete coincidence. No one knew, no one knew there was an election coming up, but just... It's just, it's just, it just happened, right? It's just been announced. So exactly, <laughs> just like the the, the scripples that were um, kind of tried the, to be killed in the fourth didn't, March, yeah. chilling on the bench. Yeah, they didn't get to their uh, underwear. Exactly. Didn't get to the underwear. Yeah. <laughs> and in the in the elections were on 18 of March, right? If I put uh, the thing, oh yeah, 18 of March. Yeah, usually they're the like in, in, in spring. Yeah, usually they're in spring of whatever the year is. Mm -hmm. Plus, that, that was a combo because it was the, Yule, the Yulia and Sergei. So it was a couple. It was a combo because also in June, and that also Alex Cristoforo once in a, in a video he pointed out, always when there is some big event, mm -hmm. and in June of 2018, it was the Moscow World Cup. Yes. A huge, yes. huge global. Event. Yeah, well, much like right, much like the 2014 Sochi Olympics uh, happened at the same time as as the Maidan escalated to to violence, right? Mm -hmm. And the you know 2008 2008 Beijing Olympics and the the Russia Georgia war that was then concluded to have been started by the Georgian pre then president Saakashvili. Yeah, there's always some major international event, and when it happens in Russia, it's especially uh, especially problematic, right? Because then there has to be some some negative pub publicity, but that's all a coincidence. Which, by the way, we're going to talk about Georgia in a two weeks time. Yes. Just so you guys keep uh, keep tuned. And uh, so, just uh, some data from that election on on two thousand eighteen election. So mm -hmm. the put the Putin won the, the one with seventy seven percent as independent. That's interesting. I don't know, is, is this the name of the party or he just run as the Putin and... He, I mean, he's officially part of United Russia. So I'm, I, I can't okay. remember, honestly, I'd have to go back and check whether he he was sort of leaving and coming back to the party. But the, the dominant party is the United Russia party in, in okay. Russia, so... And in second place was the Communist Party with 8%. Which is, you know, this is like the official opposition, but it never gets mentioned as the official opposition, which is really interesting uh, to yeah. me for many reasons. Because on the one hand, you have all these sort of conservatives that say Russia is still communist. Well, it's like, well, here is an active communist party. Now, there are many differences between the modern communist parties, such as religion, their active participation and orthodoxy. Um, but nonetheless, it's sort of like, well, there's this party, but then somehow it's never really mentioned as an opposition party in Russia. Now, of course, there are some issues on which uh, the Communist Party and United Russia aligned because not, neither one of those parties is a pro-Western party. So it's not surprising <laughs> that you can have opposition, believe it or not, that is not facing towards the West. And I know it's really shocking to, uh, you know, Kremlinologists all around the world to realize that you can have opposition that is not interested in you. They're interested in domestic issues. They're yep. interested in, you know, sort of staying within the country and improving it according to their you know, specific program, right, specific ideology. But yeah, I know this is probably why they never mention it, because to them, opposition equals pro-Western. Like, there's no other opposition that can exist. So, <laughs> so like, let's say when I criticize Putin, I criticize him for being insufficiently harsh, but I would never be mentioned. I would always be mentioned as a, a Putin shill instead of a, uh, an occasional critic of Putin because... I'm not criticizing him from a Western liberal perspective. I'm criticizing him from sort of a more hardcore, uh, maybe more a little bit more socialist on, on you know, in some some categories, obviously economically, uh, and so on and so forth. So people like me who would, you know, understandably sort of support 
his ideas in some ways, but also criticizes his ideas in other ways would never be thought of as like, oh, well, she's criticizing him, but she's not criticizing him from our perspective. Therefore, she's, she's, she's irrelevant, right? So yeah, exactly. it's, it's very interesting. And I'm just like, I'm some, I'm some chick on the internet, right? Talking, talking to you through a stream. And here we have a, a party that does gain significant popular support, right? Like this is actually important. And so mm -hmm. why, are, why are these people never mentioned? Um, as, as, as a serious political force when they are. And they, this is kind of usually how they place somewhere between, you know, like eight to 15%, maybe even higher, which is kind of significant for, for a political party uh, in a country that has multiple parties, right? So. Yeah. And so this is a question that I have. Mm -hmm. So the third place was uh, the Liberal Democratic Party with 5%. And what, which, is another, that... which is another, I would say, opposition party, right? Jerinovsky, who recently passed away, we all miss him because he's sort of been portrayed as this clown and he definitely had this clownish persona uh, because sometimes he would make these outrageous statements. But when he made more serious political commentary, people now go back to his videos from 10, 15 years ago and they say, oh my God, he predicted this thing. He predicted the war in Ukraine 15 years ago, or not even like in the 90s. He predicted this other thing to to the date. And so people kind of almost see him as this, well, kind of half jokingly as, as a prophet. But he was definitely uh, very smart, even though he had this really outrageous clownish persona. And sometimes he would say outrageous things in public. But this is how he attracted attention. So that was his party. And this party is still functional. I mean, it has other leaders. It's still a major party. And I would consider it an opposition party, too. I, I, what I found interesting also, to my complete ignorance about Russia, uh, uh, and that was my question, is that, you know, the colors of the, the party are the, the, the yellow-blue, mm -hmm. like, just, just like the Ukrainian flag. So mm -hmm. wh what I wanted to, to ask about this is what, what does these colors or this color composition means for Russia or at all? I, I, I'm not going to pretend like I know why they use yellow blue. So I know sometimes blue alone, blue and white is used in different contexts. So for instance, in the Russian but Navy, it's okay. but it's, yeah, but I've never seen, yeah, no, it's just the blue and the white would be used. No, okay, no, no they, red. they are part of the, the, the flag of Russia. But so now I'm just going to Google this because, oh, that's very interesting. Um, I, you know, because you know, the, the, the Brazilian, uh, um, soccer team, the the t-shirt can be the 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 yellow with uh, with uh, what's it called the the symbol of the 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 team or it can be the the blue and white and mm -hmm. blue and white in our flag is a minor part the, the flag is mostly right. green and yellow so mm -hmm. the, so the brazil is known by the by green and yellow you know it's right. more green and yellow but we yeah. we also have white and blue but it can be used and it's all right for 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 brazilian perspective we we do not consider that well, I, all the, I that. would say again i don't know why they're using these colors the the logo says freedom patriotism and law i know that uh, Zhirinovsky specifically had been critical of the soviet union but at the same time he you know he's been very sort of patriotic and he would oppose sort of capitalism, right? Even though it's called liberal democratic, he would also oppose the return of communism. But um, the colors, I mean, I would just make a guess. This is an educated guess that it's, I would not be surprised that an agrarian country like Russia, right, would be using the blue sky and a uh, yellow for and the land, yellow. right? That is, mm -hmm. yeah, but maybe that's not true. But I mean, I don't think, I think in the, the case of Ukraine, it's not, I mean, obviously it's their national flag, but I don't know if that's, um, exclusively right their idea of using the blue sky and then like the wheat field being being yellow right so um possibly but i think that's kind of more of a minor thing but i would definitely consider ldpr to be another opposition party that is sort of a major party i know five percent might not sound high but russia does have um, many parties and um it's definitely a party that would disagree with the ruling party on on some important issues but at the same time because they are sort of more anti-capitalist in some ways, and they're not sharing pro-Western perspectives. They're also not being mentioned as, as, an, as a major opposition party because it doesn't fit the narrative of the, you know, two percenters uh, representing, you know, like I said, the Russian, I don't think I mentioned this, the Russian Wikipedia described Navalny citing the New York Times, of course, because that's what every average Russian reads in English. They go to the New York Times <laughs> as the, like the key opposition figure to Putin. Like there's no one else. So yeah, it's really, it's, it's really kind of, uh, it's really kind of fascinating how 
uh, a much more nuanced political political environment, a political landscape in Russia is just being dumbed down to Putin versus some pro-Western liberal guy. But then that pro-Western liberal guy has very, very, very little support. So, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's kind of interesting, to say the least. Yeah. So just as another trivia, as we were talking about the, the Skripal case, there was also in 2006 the Alexander Litvinenko. Litvinenko, yeah. Litvinenko. Uh, by chance, he also died. In, in He was also poisoned. Well, he was poisoned with uh, polonio, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I don't know what it the, is about the, the UK. UK. What is it about the UK? It's just like something happens. As soon as someone goes to the UK, something happens to them there, but it's always the Russians' fault. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely, I think that initial case has been used for, for media attention to then linking it to the, you know, the super duper battle agent Le- that never seems to actually Le- do his job. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, there's definitely that, that idea. I, I, it kind of just blows my mind that people are not thinking of like, well, they're both in London, they're in the UK. Isn't there a little bit of a connection there? Uh, I mean, some people have conspiracy theories about some of these oligarchs, right, that fled Russia. And, um, you know, one of them ended up hanging himself. And he, uh, I think he ha- he hanged himself. But again, his death was, some people think his death was kind of sketchy because he was trying to apologize to Putin and come back to Russia. And, and all of a sudden he dies. So again, draw your own conclusions. If you want to put on a tinfoil hat, do so. But that's, that's sort of another thing that uh, it wasn't like a poisoning. So it didn't, you know, it's not being mentioned constantly, but it's definitely something that some people consider a little bit, a little bit sketchy with the London connection. But of course, you know, we love the UK. No, we don't. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, I mean, some people say all, all roads lead to London. Again, draw your own conclusions. I'm not sure uh, if that's the case, but it's definitely uh, that all of these coincidences that happen in London and it's kind of hard to ignore them so it just kind of blows my mind that people just overlook like it's normal (laughs) it's normal for all these poisonings to be happening there and making the you know the tabloid headlines so yeah exactly well I have to disagree that all roads bring to London this is an island so very true very true it's not (laughs) not geographically feasible yeah so exactly so I guess we have run for about one and a one one hour, 15 minutes. Uh, I think we have covered a lot of land in this uh, argument. Yeah, I was thinking of discussing his wife, but I feel like, you know, there's definitely all these attempts of, to rebrand her into this uh, grieving widow and the reality and w- what she's being branded as are two very, very, very different things. And this information is very easy to access. Uh, I know much of it is on Russian social media, so Westerners may not have seen it. Uh, but I'm hoping that this sort of this attempt falls falls flat because, um, you know, the news cycle is eventually going to run out. And in my opinion, she's not going to be useful. And hopefully in the best case scenario, she will be just forgotten. Right. But who knows? There's definitely been this this attempt to really push her very hard. And it's just to me, it's kind of shocking the difference between someone like Assange's wife, right, Stella, that who's been very, very publicly dedicated and then this, you know, I, I, in my opinion, Yulia Navalny is a merry widow. That's my opinion. You know, you are welcome to have your own opinion. But her lifestyle is far, far, far different from someone like Stella Assange. And of course, she, um, she's not really mentioned in the mainstream Western media. She's mostly mentioned in kind of human rights circles uh, as well. So that contrast is very, very, very stark to me. But um, yeah, I just think it's kind of amazing that these attempts to to push her very hard as this new figure, this new face of opposition Russia, um, someone that I, in my opinion, is also very opportunistic, much like her her late husband. Um, I think they're going to fail. So, but yeah, I think we yeah. can we can wrap it up here. This was a long discussion of um, lots of coincidences. Have... Basically, we should just call it the coincidence show. The coincidence show. Uh, yeah. I just have a, a, an observation because mm-hmm. you know all this the Putin with the uh, Tucker Carlson interview. It was very interesting how uh, how Putin uh, uh, send, you know, subliminary messages to the West, like, oh, hey, yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the brain power and all that, the mind power. And no, but it's true, like, 
guys, uh, we we can give you a holy a, holy, a hail Mary if you if you're willing. You know, we can give you a not loss. You know, not a victory. We are unable to do that, but mm -hmm. we can make your loss very, very easy. I think he was you. very explicit, and he's been explicit before, but obviously he had, a, he had a much broader audience here where he was very explicit, like, we're ready to talk. And I think he's been we're saying that for a long talk. time. We're ready to talk, not Ukrainians, talk. but the people who are, you know, the powers that in be. Charge. We're ready. Yeah, the not people in Biden. charge. He also made we're, very we're, clear yeah. that not Biden, the people in charge. Uh, we're so ready we're talk. ready to talk. We're ready to go back on doing business if you're willing to. Mm -hmm. It's your choice, not ours. But, uh, you know, uh, compared to this, you have at uh, this week, you have the, the Navalny widow going on the Munich uh, Security Conference and, you know, just basically uh, uh, telling Putin that, you know, it's his fault and he's going to pay for it, you know, mm -hmm. threatening the guy. Which you kind of got to wonder. And of course, how... you know that she's not she's not the one behind the script. She's not the one that wrote that. She's not the one that Which, which kind of is very interesting because imagine the position that someone like that would be in. Like there's clearly something about her that is, you know, has been obtained by the powers that be where she's she's making these really, really outrageous, you know, really blunt statements. And I don't think she has, uh, you know, the way back, right? She's kind of like up against a wall. Like now she's been selected as this one opposition figure because she's had all this publicity. Her Twitter went from not registering to like, I don't know what it's at now, like 300,000 or X in, you know, a couple of days because of all this publicity. So there's definitely that exploitation of social media uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's almost like when you're making such statements, there's really no going back. And then at some point you have to realize, you know, like much like Zelensky, um, you can't really escape. <laughs> you kind of have to play this role. And what happens when you're no longer useful, right? What happens when um, oh. you're no longer going to be exploited, right? So it's, it's a, definitely a precarious position to be in. And I'm not sure if these opportunists... Uh, fully understand that all the whining and dining and being showered with money and having their children sent to Ivy League universities uh, is is an infinite, you know, infinite uh, cornucopia that's going to always be there because it's at any given moment, it could just be shut off. But um, this is the position they chose to be in. So ultimately... Oh, yeah. I think whether it's fine. opportunity or being naive, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think she'll be fine as far as she stays away from London. Yeah, I know. No, no, no more trips, no shopping trips to uh, what's the famous store in London? Is it Macy's? Is it? No, no, Macy's is United the US. Like, what is it? Her Herald? What is it? I don't know. Yeah, I was just like, yeah. I'm not even going to bother Googling Stay it. Stay away from fish and chips. So. <laughs> Stay away from, from underwear uh, laden with Novichok. Stay away from, from fish and chips. <laughs> Stay away from benches in random parts of the UK while having a coffee. You might just be afraid <laughs> with this battle agent. And yeah, I definitely, that would be a very safe suggestion. But yes, we're, we're obviously joking. Uh, we hope that uh, everyone is happy and safe and uh much like, you know, like I think if you ever watch true crime, half of these true crimers say, stay safe. So we want to say, <laughs> stay safe. <laughs> stay away from London. <laughs> joking. Stay away from London. Stay away from London. Yeah. And joking. <laughs> yeah. But maybe so not. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess that's it. I would love it, to yeah. hear, if, if you guys are still tuned in, I would love to hear some of your some of your theories about some of the in the comments about some of the things we've discussed today because i know it's a it's a hot topic but it's also something that's been sort of going on in and out of publicity right for more than a more than a decade so i think people definitely have opinions on this so it'd be interesting because i do i do go read them i can't always reply sometimes i get bombarded with opinions on you know twitter slash x i can't always reply but i definitely read them so uh <laughs> definitely definitely interest i'm interested to see what you guys think exactly so Place a comment if you're on the IDM, place a comment on IDM and follow Nina. If you're on Nina, place a comment on Nina and follow the IDM. And, Don't place uh, a comment on me. Place a comment. I'm sort of trying not to have comments on me. On exactly. <laughs> on my, yeah, on my, on my socials. 
<laughs> Yellow postists. Post I know, <laughs> they're just like <laughs> freedom, democracy, <laughs> revolution. <laughs> yeah, don't post, don't post any comments directly on me. But on my socials, yeah, you're welcome to. I do read them. And That's I'm a actually, I, I, am, I am curious. I am. I know. I know for Valenciaga. <laughs> no, I'm curious because sometimes people come up with theories that I, I never think of. Right. And then you're like, you know, I'm going to start Googling this rabbit hole that they mentioned. I'm going to go in the Russian search engines so that I'm not having any censorship and I'm going to see see what I can find. And sometimes people have some, some really interesting ideas that I, you know, I haven't thought of. And I'm sure that happens to a lot of us, too. OK, thank right. you for watching. We'll be back next uh, next week. And I, I hope you enjoyed and see you very soon. Bye. See you next time, guys. Bye-bye.